The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Welcome to Short Circuit Live at UCLA. I'm Anya Bidwell, an attorney with the Institute for Justice. Uh, for our podcast listeners, uh, we just concluded rolling out a new civil rights tool that helps plaintiffs to overcome the clearly established law requirement when they fight qualified immunity. If you want to go back and watch this launch of the study, uh, which we called Constitutional GPA, it will be available on our YouTube page at the time of this episode being released. Uh, we will also, just this one time, uh, be video recording this podcast and post a video of it on our YouTube page, uh, in addition to our general audio recording, which is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Because of this launch of Constitutional GPA, we are slightly modifying the format of this recording. Our general format for these live recordings is to focus on a particular circuit court. For example, just this April, we discussed three D.C. circuit cases with Lisa Blatt, Paul Clement, and Kelsey Brown Corcoran. Eugene did one uh, with us on the Ninth Circuit right here at UCLA. And this October, we will be in New York discussing the Second Circuit's decisions. But for this particular episode, we are doing something different. We're focusing on three cases in three separate circuits involving various immunity doctrines. In addition, as we're going through these cases, we will be referring to the research tool that we just rolled out to see whether there is additional information we can glean from there. Hence, the video recording. Um, and you can find, uh, if you want to follow along, you can find this research tool on our webpage. Just Google Institute for Justice Constitutional GPA and you should be able to find it. Uh, with this in mind, uh, let's move on to introducing our uh, participants. Uh, Eugene Volok is uh, Gary T. Schwartz Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA. He teaches free speech law, religious freedom law, church-state relations law, and a First Amendment amicus brief clinic. Eugene is also a prolific author. His textbook, The First Amendment and Related Statutes, was just recently reissued in its seventh edition. One of his latest law review articles was just published in the New York University Journal of Law and Liberty and concerns bans on political discrimination in places of public accommodation and housing. Eugene's blog, Volok Conspiracy, needs no introduction. It is one of the most widely read and respected legal publications that is accessible to lawyers and non-lawyers alike. As will be relevant today, Eugene has blogged about First Amendment retaliation and whether probable cause for arrest can immunize government officials from punishing you for speech. One of Project on Immunity and Accountability cases, Gonzalez uh, versus City of Castle Hills uh, deals with that, where a woman who petitioned her government was thrown in jail in punishment for that. Um, Eugene, we will discuss this when we talk about Novak, one of our cases, but could you tell us briefly how does this uh, doctrine uh, make it difficult for plaintiffs to prevail on their First Amendment claims? Uh, sure. So uh, let's say you're arrested for your speech. Well, the first thing you want to do is not get convicted. Uh, so that would be really nice. And the First Amendment can actually do a lot of work for you as a criminal defendant. But let's say then you, you let's say you are acquitted or perhaps the prosecutor realizes this case is not a good case and drops the charges. What if you want to sue saying you were wrongly prosecuted? Well, you can't sue the prosecutor, right? Because of absolute prosecutorial immunity. But you could sue the police officers for arresting you. Uh, and your argument may very well be they arrested me in retaliation for my speech. And the general, defend, uh, the general uh, doctrine says that uh, uh, retaliatory arrest claim, uh, generally speaking, uh, will be defeated by the police officer defendants if they can show probable cause that you violated some statute. But courts say, and in fact, we'll see that come up uh, in Novak, uh, uh, courts say protected speech, protected, constitutionally protected speech cannot serve as the basis for probable cause. So there's a multi-step inquiry here, but what it ultimately adds up to uh, is that uh, if you're engaged in protected speech, then 
you shouldn't be arrested for the speech. On the other hand, if you're engaged in unprotected speech, well, then, of course, you could be arrested. Presumably, if it's unprotected, it may also be criminally punishable. And, as we'll get to shortly, if it's a close call, whether your speech was protected or not, uh, and, but uh, then uh, uh, the police officers may be entitled to qualified immunity in your civil lawsuit against them. Thanks for that. Um, Julia, you, uh, let's talk about you. You are a civil rights attorney with Iredale L and you, uh, a civil rights and criminal defense law firm based in San Diego. Uh, Julia uh, is also the president of the National Police Accountability Project, the country's largest civil rights attorneys organization. Over the past, over the span of her 24 year civil rights career, Julia has represented individuals fighting unconstitutional prison conditions, wrongful arrest, or the use of excessive force, as well as wrongful death. She won an important civil rights case right here in the Ninth Circuit, Brian versus McPherson, involving the use of tasers. One of our own IJ cases, Paul Rees versus Martolf, that we're fighting in the Eighth Circuit right now, has relied on Brian to establish clearly established law. Um, Julia, this case, McPherson, Brian versus McPherson, makes for a fascinating read. You prevailed both on the underlying constitutional claim and also that it was clearly established. Could you briefly talk about this case and kind of its significance and what it meant for plaintiffs here? So uh, Brian versus McPherson is an emotional roller coaster. Thank you so much for taking me back. <laughs> You're always welcome. <laughs> so what had happened is in the beginning, um, the use of the taser actually happened years before the decision, which happened in, it came out in 2010. The use of the taser in that case happened in 2006. So it was a very new technology. And at the time we had some concerns when we first took it that we we're going to have problems with um with qualified immunity because there was not a lot of case law on how and when you could properly use it. So what happened in that case is <clears throat> that we argued it, we received this incredible opinion that was that was so um, inclusive in the way that you could or could not use the taser because at the time people were just using it indiscriminately on pregnant women, on children, on vulnerable people, people standing in water. Under so many circumstances, people were just using it instead of actually engaging the citizen. Um, in this case, people who are you know, mentally disturbed or um, having a difficult day. They really just needed to be spoken to. But they were just immediately resorting to use of force. So what Brian first decided uh, was that the, this was um, excessive force and that um, the officer was not entitled to qualified immunity. Then they filed for petition for rehearing and en banc. Uh, then there was a superseding opinion about four months later that said essentially the same thing, really beautiful language about people who uh, need help, people who might be mentally ill, where you cannot use uh, the taser. But at the end of the opinion, it said, however, because there was not a case clearly on point, uh, the officer was entitled to qualified immunity. So we did end up losing the second round when there was a superseding opinion. Yeah, but going forward. That's right. Going that's the forward. Key. That's right. Going forward, as of that day, it was clearly established that you could not use a taser under those circumstances. Yeah, and that kind of will come up in the case that you will introduce Rivera, where it ended up being in a very similar posture. Um, and in contrast, you were also involved in uh, the Frazier case out of the Tenth Circuit. Um, could you briefly tell us about that case and kind of qualified immunity is all about, you know, they always say uh, in, uh, plainly incompetent or knowingly violating the law that qualified immunity wouldn't shield you. What happened there? Yeah. So in Frazier, the plaintiff uh, was a bystander. He sees the Denver police officers using excessive force, what he thinks is unreasonable use of force on another citizen. So he is taping it on his iPad. The officers see this happening. They approach him. They want to confiscate it. Their words exchanged. Uh, they detain him. They take the iPad. He claims that they deleted the the video of uh, of, of the incident. Uh, he later sues. What the Tenth Circuit did was so interesting because there was an admission by the department and the police officers that they knew 
The officers knew that what they were doing was wrong, that they had been trained, that there were policies that uh, citizens have a right to record the police and you may not confiscate, you may not detain people for videotaping police officers engaging uh, in, in this kind of conduct in public. They knew that, they admitted to that. But Frazier said that the officers were entitled to qualified immunity anyway because the fact that they knew that they were violating the law, that the officers knew that and admitted to that, was not relevant for purposes of qualified immunity because the standard is an objective officer, not what these officers knew at the time. And then what do we make of the phrase of plainly incompetent and uh, knowingly violate the law? It's completely meaningless, at least in the Tenth Circuit, that you are uh, knowingly violating the law. You're still entitled to the shield. So the question then is, what's the reasonable officer? Isn't the reasonable officer one that has been trained to not do that? But they do not go into that analysis. And what is really troubling is that the Tenth Circuit does not then say, like Brian Uh, That as of today, it is clearly established that you can't arrest people for filming officers in public. Yes, so there is no that important victory for plaintiffs going forward. Correct. There's never going to be a robust consensus of cases in the Tenth Circuit because they have not taken that step. And the Supreme Court denied review. That's exactly right. And here we are, Nick. To you, (laughs) since you practice in state courts, maybe you can illuminate uh, uh, for us kind of like an alternative way to do this. But before I put you on the spot on that, let me introduce you. Nick Yoka, he is a civil rights and personal injury lawyer with Punish Shia Boyle Ravipudi LLP here in Los Angeles. Uh, He has handled a number of high profile cases since joining the firm, including against the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and its deputy. Deputies. The New Yorker recently wrote an amazing article on this very sheriff's department. I recommend everybody read it. Um, and Nick, could you tell us more about that case, whatever you can, Gordado versus L.A. County Sheriff's Department and what you're doing there and where you're pursuing those claims? Of course, Anya, and thanks for having me. Excited to be here. The case is Andres Gordado uh, versus the Sheriff's Department, County of Los Angeles. Andres uh, a little over two years ago, was 18 years old working at an auto body shop uh, as a security guard when two deputies pulled up and proceeded to chase him down an alley where he was shot in the back five times and killed. Each of those bullets, through independent forensic pathologist findings, found that they were independently lethal. Any one of those bullets could have killed Andres. And so the question here, well, an important part because you brought up the sheriff's department and the New Yorker article is the fact that there are known and have been known for decades gangs to exist within the sheriff's department in different uh, offices throughout LA County. This really went to the heart of our concerns throughout cases against the sheriff's department that they harbor culture of violence and they haven't done enough to over the many years to stop this. We found out through whistleblower information in the sheriff's department and sworn testimony that these two deputies were, quote, uh, chasing ink, which means that when you do a high profile killing as a deputy, you actually become a member of one of these uh, gangs within the sheriff's department. In this case, the executioners, which is known to be in Compton, and you get uh, ink a rite of passage almost within the department. And these are known to exist. And so that's where the case is. And as you said, we decided to file it uh, in state court, which is the opposite of what many civil rights litigators do. Uh, I assure you, Anya, it wasn't a decision that we took lightly. Uh, And we do file many cases in federal court. However, we often do favor state court for a number of reasons, which uh, Julia and I, before this, were having a, a little banter on uh, the <laughs> Let's benefits. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. So why do you court. file in state courts? It, it's very case specific, I think. And you really do need to look for what's best for your client. We have the fortune here, first of all, of being in California. So let's just get that right out front. Uh, the only really issue with qualified immunity is from we have many other states and we have the fortune of being in California, we have the Bain Act. 
Civil Code Section 52.1. Marie, could you maybe pull up the uh, California um, Fifty Shades of Government Immunity so uh, people can see the Bain Act and what we... Yeah, so if you were to go to California, California gets a relatively high grade for this. Um, uh, yeah, because because of the Bain Act where... Go ahead. Yeah. So the Bain Act is what you could call our baby 1983 claim. And it allows for uh, claims with when there is attempt or uh, in, to attempt to interfere with constitutional rights. And we don't have to deal in state court with uh, everything that you've been talking about lots of times in terms of the 1983 qualified immunity cases. And that's a big benefit. Uh, we also have the benefit of not having to deal with interlocutory appeals on those issues, right? One of the hardest things when you really deal with clients that are going through this, which the loss of loved one, a child, a spouse, is litigation is painful. Explain uh, to listeners what interlocutory appeal means and why it's so bad. Of course. So when you have a 1983 claim and a motion to dismiss is brought against the federal and state claims within a complaint, and it's, let's say, denied as to the federal claims and granted as state claims, they have the right on the 1983 claim in federal court to immediately appeal that to the appellate court. And so that causes a delay in litigation. Appellate courts take a long time, and this really does uh, hamper the process. And you have to go explain to your clients, hey, uh, I don't know how long this is going to take, but we're going to have some backup here, and we'll see what happens. And that's terrifying for clients, I think. In, in California, we have a great justice system with qualified, competent judges that we believe are capable of handling these. Plus, we can also bring all the state law claims that are generally in federal court civil rights cases uh, as is. That's fascinating. And Julia, you generally practice in federal courts. I do, which is ironic because we love the Bain Act. I actually served as a technical legal expert for SB2 last year, which served to take away some of the governmental immunities under the Bain Act. And yet I'm still tethered to the federal court for some reason. <laughs> it makes zero sense. But Nick is absolutely right. Absolutely right. So maybe if you're in California, for plaintiffs out there, you know, try your luck with the Bain uh, Civil Rights Act before you have to fight qualified immunity at the federal level. At least food for thought. Um, all right. Uh, on that note, let's uh, get straight to the cases. And let's begin with uh, Novak out of the Sixth Circuit. Uh, it touches on many issues. Uh, First Amendment retaliation, qualified immunity, even state law. So, uh, Eugene, could you introduce the case for us? Sure. So, uh, the city of Parma, Ohio, is part of a long but, I think, regrettable American tradition of uh, uh, deceptively naming towns that have nasty, unpleasant weather, certainly during the winter, after balmy Mediterranean places, like uh, my... uh, 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 people, people who go to, Ith- to Cornell in Ithaca, New York. I hope they're fully aware that there's a large gulf between that and the original Ithaca. Warning. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless, city of Parma, Ohio, uh, the, the name for a residence, is a, at least according to Wikipedia, is Parmesans, um, uh, it was in fact named after Parma, Italy, by, by an early leader who thought Parma was beautiful and Parma, Ohio should be as beautiful. Uh, In any event, uh, uh, for reasons probably unrelated to its name, Anthony Novak decided to put together uh, what he characterized, probably probably accurately, as a parody of the Parma Police Department page. Now, one thing to keep in mind with parodies uh, or satires, depending on how you define it, is you want to be close enough that it seems plausible, at least at first, it seems like this is the real thing. But you don't want to be too close, right? Let, let's just step a step away from the, the uh, 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 prosecution and police officers in Section 1983 and look at a situation where this comes up not infrequently is libel law, right? Uh, if I put up a web page kind of copying your web page with enough in it that people looking at it say, oh, yeah, okay, I get the joke, then that's not libel. On the other hand, if it's 
really totally deadpan, uh, or there are other signals, maybe you have yourself a funny page, well, I put up a funny page based on your funny page, and it puts words in your mouth that will diminish your reputation if people believe them, and people do believe them, and maybe that I am uh, uh, liable for defamation. Uh, so there's always a difficult line to, I shouldn't say always, sometimes it's perfectly clear, uh, but, there, but uh, uh, there, there's often a difficult line to draw, and there are cases. There's a Texas Supreme Court case involving, uh, involving a, 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 a parody called New Times versus Isaacs, which is actually a pretty prominent precedent that comes out pretty much in favor of the, uh, of, uh, of the speakers there. Uh, but it's something that, that comes up not infrequently. Uh, in uh, um, uh, in uh, libel litigation comes up not infrequently in trademark litigation as well with trademark parodies. Uh, well, so here he put together this uh, web page and uh, uh, it uh, published half a dozen posts advertising, this is in quotes, uh, the department's efforts, including free abortions in a police van and a pedophile reform event featuring a no means no learning station. Um, so, so apparently some people's reaction was, ah, ha, ha, got, I got it, that's funny. Other people uh, uh, didn't fully grasp it was fake. And apparently that, that uh, uh, alerted the, the police department, uh, uh, and at least some of them seem to have been potentially confused. Um, it should also be noted that some of them posted comments on his page saying it was fake, and then he deleted those comments. And you can understand why, because the comments might kind of ruin the fun in some respects, but also deleting the comments makes it probably somewhat more likely people will be confused. Um, and on top of that, um, uh, uh, the department, once it heard about this, uh, uh, posted a notice on its actual page confirming it was the official account and warning that the fa fake page was being investigated. And then Novak copied the post onto his page uh, allegedly, quote, to deepen his satire, close quote. So he was prosecuted. He was prosecuted under a statute that actually makes it illegal to disrupt or impair police functions using a computer. So it wasn't specifically an impersonation statute. Some states have criminal impersonation statutes. Um, uh, but this is a more general uh, statute. Um, and uh, uh, the warrants uh, uh, were, uh, were, were issued, he was arrested, uh, he was prosecuted, uh, indicted, and then acquitted. So before we think, complain too much about him losing his case, he, he was a winner in some measure. Now, you know, you never want to be even prosecuted and acquitted, but still, the good news at least is he was acquitted. Uh, so the jury probably on the facts concluded that indeed uh, this wasn't disruptive enough because a reasonable person would have conclude would have recognized that that it was uh, it was a parody. And of course, the the standard in a, a criminal proceeding is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So maybe the jury just said we have a reasonable doubt about this. So then he turns around and sues, and he sues for uh, retaliatory arrest. He says in violation of the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment, as we discussed um, uh, for first. Uh, to make out a First Amendment, uh, uh, excuse me, to make out a retaliatory arrest theory, you have to show that there was no probable cause for the arrest. Uh, but in First Amendment cases, protected speech cannot serve as the basis for probable cause. So it came down, at least in theory, it came down to whether the uh, speech was in fact constitutionally protected or whether it might fit into an exception to First Amendment protection. The law on that question is not completely clear. But it is pretty clear that at least certain kinds of knowing falsehoods that are sufficiently harmful are punishable. Classic examples are libel, perjury, uh, uh, fraud. But also, courts have generally said that impersonating uh, government officials, if it, if it is likely to be seen as serious impersonation, is uh, punishable, and of course that makes sense. I mean, imagine people could freely impersonate police officers or impersonate the IRS or whatever else, either in person or, or online. So you get this difficult First Amendment question. The law is not completely resolved. How the law would apply to these facts would not be completely resolved. Aha, says the Sixth Circuit, qualified immunity to the rescue. Um, while probable cause here may be difficult, Qualified immunity is not. 
That's because qualified immunity protects officers who reasonably pick one side or the other in a debate, the debate here meaning the question as to whether this is punishable, where judges could reasonably disagree. That's just what the officers did. They reasonably found probable cause in an unsettled case as judges can debate. So good for the police officers, maybe also good for the judges here, right? Because it, it means they don't have to then go through and do more of a complicated analysis. To be sure, the Sixth Circuit has used plenty of time on this, but at least this, this makes it an easier case for the judges, and it makes it a winning case for the police officers. That's, that's the whole thing. Now note one other thing which, uh, uh, which was hinted at uh, a little bit earlier on is, so Novak loses because there's a reasonable question as to whether, whether under, exist, under the current not fully settled uh, state of the law, uh, this is a parody. But also, the law doesn't become any more settled, precisely because all that the Sixth Circuit has said is reasonable people can disagree on this hard question. It didn't offer its own answer to this hard question. So here's, here's one thing that... Uh, uh, that one can worry about when it comes to qualified immunity, besides the question of whether police officers may win a particular case. One might worry is that qualified immunity would interfere with the development of the law, with new precedents being set. So back, uh, uh, let's say, 20 years and change ago now, in a case called Saucier versus Katz, the court tried to deal with this problem by saying, look, we're all for qualified immunity, but courts should generally decide the substantive question first. So in this situation, should decide, is this or is this not constitutionally protected speech? And then once they decide it, that sets a precedent going forward, establishes the law going forward, then they ask if it is protected speech, so if the, uh, law, uh, if the police officer's uh, uh, actions were unconstitutional, should they nonetheless get qualified immunity? And if that's so, then they're not liable, but at least future officers who act the same way in a similar situation would be liable. Then, in 2009, in Pearson v. Callahan, the court changed course. And it said, you know, we've experimented with Saucier versus Katz. It hasn't really proved to be that, that successful. Um, and the, so what the court held was the Saucier procedure should not be regarded as an inflexible requirement. You shouldn't always, as a judge, lower court judge, feel, oh, I have to go through the substantive analysis first and then go through the qualified immunity analysis. It's okay if, if you think that the qualified immunity case is very strong and the other uh, and the substantive thing is quite difficult. It's okay in some cases like that uh, to just go to qualified immunity, even though that means no more precedent is going to be set in this case going, going forward. Well, one thing that I've noticed, and I don't have a system, I haven't done a systematic uh, review, but in lots and lots of cases, uh, my guess is the majority of cases, think certainly I, this is what happened in Novak, uh, the court says, oh, oh, we're just going to sk skip right to qualified immunity. So rather than what Pearson said is that saucier procedure shouldn't be regarded as an inflexible requirement, they basically reject the saucier procedure at all and just say, look, the easiest thing to do is resolve the qualified immunity, then we don't have to say anything more about the substance. And I can see the value of that. That ties into the uh, uh, argument that the courts ought to resolve questions uh, on as narrow bases as possible, especially constitutional questions. They ought not reach the constitutional question when they've got some other way of resolving the case. But the downside is precedent doesn't get set. And in future cases, likewise, police officers say, oh, well, there's no clearly established law because in these previous cases, the law wasn't clearly established since they went just straight to qualified immunity. That troubles me. Maybe it troubles me a little too much because I'm not a practicing lawyer and certainly not a city side practicing lawyer primarily. I am an academic and uh, as an academic, I want lots of legal decisions and I, and I have faith in the ability of precedent to help guide people. Lots of people, uh, other people say, no, no, on balance, having more of these precedents that isn't really that useful and it's just extra time and effort for, uh, for judges and extra risk of error and such. But I am inclined, at the very least, one cost of the current qualified immunity system isn't just that police officers might win in cases when they acted unconstitutionally. It's that we get less law set as to what is and is not uh, constitutional, uh, constitutionally permissible action because courts just skip straight to qualified immunity and don't resolve the substantive issue.
And we see that in some circuit courts, right? For example, the Fifth Circuit uh, very often would say it is the practice of this court to answer the constitutional question first. So judges do see the problem with the Pearson standard, where they say at the very least what we can do is answer the constitutional question. So going forward, kind of like in your case, Julia, uh, with Brian, everybody knows you Tasing somebody is excessive force rather than punting like they did in Frazier or like they did here uh, and not establish constitutional um, right going forward. But Eugene, uh, in the um, earlier round of this case, judges actually said that qualified immunity did not protect the officers, right, on the motion to dismiss. Right. So motion to dismiss early on in the process before uh, before any any fact finding, before any discovery, courts uh, are often inclined to allow the case to go forward, sort of understanding that we'll have another shot later on at the summary judgment stage, let's say, uh, to try to figure out if uh, uh, if uh, the case should be should be dropped, and that's what happened here. I'm not. I don't know. Again, quite how often it happens, but it happens often enough that the court denies the motion to dismiss, but then later grants the motion for summary judgment. Thank Thankfully, at the motion to dismiss stage, there actually was an opinion that actually provided some some uh, uh, signal going forward that at least uh, at least uh, government officials ought to be careful in going after things that might be parody, because if it's clearly enough parodic, then it is uh, uh, constitutionally protected. But not much not, uh, uh, was resolved there, which is one reason why uh, why uh, in uh, the, at the, the in the later stage uh, uh, later phase of the case, the court just said, "Look, you know, this is still a difficult question, so we're going to grant immunity." And it kind of goes to what you were talking about, Nick, with interlocutory appeals, because here you basically have a case where defendants can take it up on appeal uh, at the motion uh, to dismiss stage, then plaintiff prevails there, they go back down, and they have a second shot at it at the motion for summary judgment stage, where again, they freeze litigation in place and go back up on appeal to fight qualified immunity at motion on motion for summary judgment, and this time they prevail. So plaintiffs would have to go to the Supreme Court to fight this. Yeah, one thing I should say is interlocutory appeals uh, are often quite difficult to, to obtain. Uh, generally speaking, the in part precisely to avoid delay, the court system uh, does say, you know, you've got to wait until there's a final judgment and then appeal everything once. Of course, the downside is if you don't get an interlocutory appeal, then you might have to spend a lot of time and money and effort and then if, uh, to get the, the judgment, go through perhaps even a whole trial and then do the appeal and the court says, you know, it should have been dismissed as a legal matter in the first place. And in fact, when it comes to anti-slap statutes, which are there to protect speakers uh, as, as defendants against, uh, against uh, 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 kind of unfounded libel claims and uh, various other uh, uh, speech torts, um, there, uh, advocates of liberty are usually big fans of interlocutory appeals because it's important to protect the speaker uh, and to allow the speaker to get the case dismissed as early as possible rather than, again, putting the speaker to the position of, in the position of having to defend uh, the case all the way through trial and after, and then perhaps winning an appeal. Uh, so in certain situations, under the anti-slap statutes, when it comes to speaker defendants, qualified immunity when it comes to government official defendants, courts do allow interlocutory appeal and trade off some of this delay uh, in the final resolution of the case if the appeal ends up not dismissing the case. Uh, they're hoping that in that the, that the benefit corresponding to that cost is that uh, maybe the case would end up being dismissed early as a legal matter and thus save, uh, save the legal system and the litigants' uh, uh, time, money, and effort. And the, the thing about interlocutory reviews with qualified immunity, as you guys know, it's pretty much as of right – interlocutory appeal is always available. And not only does it bring in qualified immunity issues, it also bring, brings in issues of suing federal official in the first place, for example, the Bivens question, or in the Novak uh, situation, it brings uh, in the question of whether probable cause existed to kind of bring it up to appeal. Let's, um, let's move to, um, let's show our listeners and viewers how uh, Novak would go about uh, using this um, uh, study of ours uh, to try to find 
some sort of clearly established constitutional law. So he's in Ohio. Uh, let's go to this Ohio, and it's in the Sixth Circuit. Um, um, so speech, religion, assembly, um, government worker uh, did something b because of something I wrote or expressed. And then let's do the retaliation, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So showcases. So even though in this case, the court did not choose to look at uh, uh, some of the clearly established law uh, that could be on point, um, there's something that a plaintiff could potentially hang on to, right? Like this Kennedy uh, case, for example, where the court says that Kennedy's right to be free from retaliatory arrest uh, after insulting an officer was clearly established. Uh, motivation may be difficult to ascertain after the fact, but once the fact finder determines that protected speech motivated the arrest, the illegality of the arrest becomes readily apparent. So this is something at least to get you started on a case like this, where you could go and look at the facts of the case, look at what the court is saying, look at how it's dealing with motion to dismiss versus motion for summary judgment, and uh, see if that can get you to at least make a persuasive argument in your brief that qualified immunity should not uh, protect the officer at that stage. Um, all right, that was great. Let's uh, talk about Rivera, Julia, um, and, um, and, and, and kind of um, we'll touch on Pearson there as well, but do tell us about the facts. Sure. So Michael Rivera is incarcerated and he files a lawsuit related to his condition of confinement. His case is meritorious enough that it is set for a jury trial. So Mr. Rivera gets transferred to another facility where he is supposed to have access to the mini law library. The law library has no books in it. The law library does have two computers that do not work. So Mr. Rivera makes a request uh, from the law librarian for the federal rules of civil procedure and federal rules of evidence. And the librarian says no. They don't fix the computers. They give him no books. So obviously, because he is not a trained lawyer, he cannot establish foundation for the documents and the evidence that he needs at trial. The evidence does not come in, and the jury finds against him in the underlying case. Undeterred, Mr. Rivera bravely files this lawsuit, saying that he was denied access to courts because he was denied any, any form of books or any material that would have assisted him in his case. Mm -hmm. What is really interesting in this case is that the, they start out great. The premise is uh, prisoners have a well-settled constitutional right to access the courts to challenge their convictions and conditions of confinement. So that's the first sentence. There's additional language in this case, which I think is amazing. Um, so the Third Circuit wrote, because we recognize that a prisoner has a constitutional right of access to the courts in order to file a lawsuit concerning the conditions of confinement, it is ludicrous to hold that the right of access stops once the complaint has been filed. So the Third Circuit recognizes there is precedent that obviously, very obviously, Mr. Rivera has a right to access the courts. He has that right before he files a lawsuit. Uh, so how do we frame that issue? Does that right stop once he has already filed the case? Does that stop go away just because he's preparing to try the case that he was entitled to file to challenge the conditions of confinement? The Third Circuit also says, indeed, it would be perverse if the right to access courts faded away after a prisoner successfully got into court by filing a complaint or petition. They say it would be perverse. And yet the Third Circuit does exactly that, finds that there is qualified immunity and that Mr. Rivera may not maintain his lawsuit against the deputies or the law librarian uh, that denied him access to court. So that is it. But the Third Circuit does say from that moment on, moving forward, they find that it is clearly established that there is law, that you cannot do what these defendants have done, which is to deny access to the courts 
past the date of the filing of the lawsuit. So what's fascinating to me there is that you do have a Supreme Court case uh, bounds, right? And it specifically says that prisoners have a constitutional right of access to the courts. That's what it says. It doesn't just say right of access at the complaint stage. Correct. Correct. So why is that not enough to put reasonable official on warning that what they're doing is unconstitutional? So I think the Third Circuit, as in many other courts, really try to dissect it for no reason. I don't know why. It would have been sufficient. It, It was on paper sufficient to say they have right to access the courts. Bounds did not say, oh, but only on Tuesdays. It did not say it only exists until you have, you know, your stamped document of a complaint. It doesn't stop there. There was no qualifier under the Supreme Court precedent that said it only exists until the day you're able to file the complaint. It it was silent as to that. But then it it sort of created a problem for itself to say, well, then there are these subsequent cases, there's a split, you know, the Ninth Circuit says something else about the courts that extend to something else. And so it really sort of created an excuse, even though it found that it was ludicrous to do so. It was ludicrous, but they went there anyway on purpose to give qualified immunity and then to take it to, and to, to rein it in a little bit on balance, I suppose, um, to say from today on, though, that there is no clear dividing line of when you can access the courts and when you can't. And that goes to the district court decision where the district court actually said we're not even go, (coughs) Eugene, to your point about Pearson, we're not even going to get into talking about whether there is a constitutional right for uh, accessing courts, but we will say that that right is not clearly established. So at least the court here is reaching and saying we will affirm, but we will also say that there is a right and going forward plaintiffs have that right. That is correct. And that is a dangerous trend that we tend to see across the board, no matter which circuit. I think district courts are shy and hesitant to say, I'm going to find, I'm going to find that this was a constitutional violation. It's much easier just to go to the second step of Pearson to say, well, there isn't another case exactly on point. I think there's a danger to that because really the standard that we have to show is the a robust consensus. We're never going to get there if the judges are not saying, hey, this is out of bounds. So because there's no case law, we can't ever get there. And that's precisely what we were discussing about Frazier. Yes, that's exactly right. And um, uh, Davy Rao of MacArthur Justice Center litigated this case uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Third Circuit. And I just want to quote from what she said uh, about this when I asked her. She said, it's a tragedy that qualified immunity prevents the judiciary from redressing constitutional wrongs like this one the first time it encounters them. But that kind of goes to the point of the obviousness exception, though, right? Technically, we have this exception for obvious violations of the constitutional rights that even if you encounter it the first time, probably because it is such an outrageous violation, for example, and there hasn't been precedent on point, it doesn't mean that the lack of precedent and on point should necessarily prevent you from overcoming qualified immunity. And this case seems like a good candidate for that exception, though they don't take advantage of that. And I want to highlight, Marie, uh, for people just the, so this is a very new case, Rivera. It just came out two weeks ago, and it's not in our database. So here's how, if you see a case that you want to let us know about, so we keep updating this thing. Can you show them like where they would go and just kind of uh, scroll down and here's the case information. Just a little thing. Just give us the name of the case. We're going to collect all of them. We're going to look at them. And if they fit the criteria, we're going to include them. This way we have uh, this situation on point. And Rivera is going to be a very important case to include because now in the Third Circuit, there is clearly established constitutional law on access to courts post the complaint stage. Now, uh, Nick, let's talk about your case. Um, It kind of is um, a complement to the other two that we talked about, uh, because uh, even though it's coming from a federal circuit court, um, it's uh, really about state law and alternative doors of litigation. Uh, Can you tell us about RA? 
Yes, as the state law guy, I'll, uh, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll get, jump right in. <laughs> it also is a compliment to that case because it really does uh, show, which we'll see, is uh, rights without remedies really renders the rights meaningless. And, and so GA, it's a very sad set of facts in this case. GA, who has autism and difficulties communicating functionally, uh, starts first grade in North Carolina elementary school and he's assigned to a teacher by the name of Robin Johnson. Uh, immediately, certain child abuse allegations come to light, including a, a trash can incident in 2017 where GA is placed in a trash can and the cover is put over it. And for a period of time, he's not let out while the teacher, Miss Johnson, states, if you act like trash, we'll treat you like trash. More of these allegations come about, but really important for that specific instance was that a, uh, another employee of the government witnessed that incident and reported it up to the principal. At this point, it's alleged in the complaint that uh, the principal, along with three other government officials for the school district, knew about this and failed to report it or take further investigative action. More allegations continue, and he GA goes on to second grade, where unfortunately he is left again with this same school teacher, Robin Johnson. During that time, a few more things come to light, including at one point she spills her hot lunch, the grease from her hot lunch on GA's head, that he has a she puts a, her hand over his mouth at one point to stop him from being disruptive. She refuses to replace a broken desk because, or I don't know why, because it's cruel, but it, forcing GA to stand for prolonged periods of time uh, in second grade. Fortunately, he has a new teacher in the third grade, and he is, at that point, communicates to his mother about some of the incidents that have occurred. The mother, obviously, as any parent would do, uh, immediately looks into it and finds that there is another parent that actually had similar allegations against the same teacher. This teacher ends up uh, pleading guilty to two counts of misdemeanor uh, for abuse or assault of a, a disabled person. And then at this point, RA, as the guardian ad litem to GA files suit in federal court based on federal constitutional violations, and state law violations. Uh, what happens next is that immediately a 12B6 motion is filed for the government individuals, uh, the individual defendants here, saying there's, no, uh, there's nothing here, you, we have qualified immunity. The district court grants the qualified immunity as to the federal cause of action, but not as to the state cause of action. So that's where we come to this opinion in the Fourth Circuit, where Judge Wilkinson in the Fourth Circuit looks at this and the state law cause of action and has to analyze it under a, a state qualified immunity rules. And Marie, let's pull up North Carolina um, and what he uh, Judge Wilkinson is looking at as he is analyzing this opinion. Um, so scroll down uh, where uh, it talks about employees um, versus public officials. Um, wh wh what is the heart of the opinion for, uh, and heart of the matter for Judge Wilkinson here? Yeah, the heart of the opinion is he looks at, well, what is the rule in North Carolina? And really, if qualified immunity will apply if the official is using lawful exercising lawful judgment and discretion and doesn't act with malice or corruption. And so that really becomes the heart of the opinion. And the plaintiff says, well, wait, wait hold on here. They definitely didn't, the, the discretion and judgment shouldn't apply here because there's actually a mandatory reporting statute for child abuse. And he says, no, 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 no. Judge Wilkinson says in any sort of teaching environment, there's so much discretion that we're going to allow this. If you ask me, it, my personal opinion, it doesn't sound very mandatory then of a mandatory reporting act. Uh, and so that's definitely something that pokes or sticks out to me in the sense that hey, well, why even have a mandatory reporting uh, act? But he says, nope, 
these are difficult jobs. And of course, teachers and school officials do have very difficult jobs, but we're going to grant discretion there. Then he looks at malice or corruption. And this is, according to Judge Wilkinson, more of a procedural issue that there was no actual specific malice or corruption in the complaint, which you say, well, what about all these acts that you just named? Well, he says you really need to specify malice or corruption. But even if they did, that it doesn't really apply here because under state law, reckless indifference isn't enough for intent. And so that's kind of where the ruling comes down, which I think kind of in a sense, the ultimate rule is, and maybe people would disagree, but that under, Cal under North Carolina law, individual public officials who allegedly know about child abuse or allegations of child abuse, I, I should say, uh, have for those state law claims of mere negligence qualified immunity shielding them. And I think that sets a dangerous precedent possibly for future decisions there. Yeah, and it's really interesting. North Carolina, if you go up, uh, it's, it scores pretty high uh, as far as states are concerned. C plus is a very good ra yeah, grade in terms of <laughs> state <laughs> It's like, well done, you. Um, but really, the reason it's great, uh, it, 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 it scores so well is because, first of all, they have an um, implied cause of action under the Constitution. So if you violate constitutional law under North Carolina, you can go to court. And there isn't qualified immunity that's codified as an extra step under North Carolina Constitution. And second of all, they do allow suits against employees, right? So this teacher, she is an employee and Claims against her are continuing to proceed. But these other officials, right, like the superintendent and uh, uh, th those folks are officials, not employees. And because they are officials, they are exempt from that negligence statute. Um, so it's kind of uh, interesting in that case. I think it showcases also kind of the di difficulty between what does it mean to be an official versus what does it mean to be an employee, right? Hard line to draw. And what is a, as you mentioned, discretionary act versus a ministerial act, uh, which is also very hard to draw, hard line to draw. One thing I wanted to ask you guys, and that's kind of to all of you, um, uh, is uh, this idea of alternative remedies, right? And Eugene, you kind of talked about Novak and you said not all is bad for Novak, right? <laughs> he was prosecuted, but he was acquitted. So there's some sort of vindication there. And with this teacher, she, you know, had to go through administrative proceedings and other things uh, that kind of tried to hold her to account. So what would you say to people who say, you know, well, you know, it didn't work out that badly for them. Why do they need, you know, uh, a way to sue for violations of civil rights? What is so special about being able to do it uh, that way? What would you tell them? Why, why an individual remedy for civil rights is uh, so important rather than just being able to, frankly, maybe hold somebody criminally accountable or also be acquitted yourself if you're being tried. Well, I, I could briefly yeah. address that. I think that a lot of times in situations, uh, particularly with police excessive force cases, they aren't criminally charged. And sometimes, the unfortunately, the only route to get justice for that client and these people stay in court against certain government officials and individuals is through the civil justice system, which is why we have a civil justice system altogether. Yeah, and uh, go ahead, Julia. Yeah, so there are only three different ways in which uh, a, a constitutional violation like this can be remedied, right? Which it's not just about the individual that has been wrong, but it's a wrong against the entire community when there is this kind of a breach of trust by law enforcement. So one is criminal prosecution, and that so rarely happens. I think one of the studies revealed maybe less than 1% of cases where uh, an official is charged with the crime. The second avenue is internal affairs or some sort of an internal discipline. 
And that also is exceedingly rare, but even more problematic than rarity is that lack of transparency. The public is not entitled to see what happens in those sort of, you know, behind the scenes, secretive proceedings. We don't know. And it is not a way in which an officer can be publicly held to account for their actions because it's all secret. So it offers no remedy to the greater community for a wrong that has been committed. So really the only thing that is left in which the, the, the victims themselves feel empowered because they also are making decisions about how a case proceeds in a civil matter, it really is the only way is to have available a remedy in civil court. That really, that's the only thing. We can't give people their lives back. The only way we can give them sense of justice is a proceeding that is public. Yeah, I think that's uh, a great way to, a great note to end on and something for people to really think about the importance of vindicating your rights um, in civil courts uh, and uh, how qualified immunity, among other doctrines, stands in the way of it in multitude of ways. And it ways. sends a message to the other officers. I think that that's the strongest, the, the, really the driving reason for why our clients want to do something. It's not really about them as much as they don't want this to continue. They don't want other victims in the community. Totally. It assures government accountability when nobody else is and Excellent. Well, thank you all so much, Eugene, Julia, Nick. It's been an honor to have you. And thank you for celebrating this launch of the GPA, Constitutional GPA Research Tool with us. And I encourage everybody listening, watching, and being here with us to uh, play around with it. It's actually a lot of fun. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.